Chicago is filled with Christian churches, from humble storefront communities to gleaming cathedrals, megachurches, houses of worship representing a vast variety of ethnic faith groups, liturgies, music, and tradition. But in Chicago, one church stands above them all, literally. The Chicago Temple, First United Methodist Church, is from street to spire, the tallest church building in the world. And the congregation housed in this magnificent 568 foot tall skyscraper is Chicago's oldest. In 1831, the United States of America was only 56 years old. New York, already America's largest city, had only 200,000 residents. And an American Baptist minister, Samuel Francis Smith, wrote the lyrics to a patriotic hymn, My Country Tis of Thee. Illinois, admitted to the Union in 1818, had its state capital in Vandalia, 250 miles to the south near St. Louis. The frontier trading post known as Chicago was a crude assembly of log cabins strategically located on the mouth of a river that emptied into Lake Michigan. A fur trader of African and French descent named Jean-Baptiste Pontusable was its first non-native settler in the 1770s. According to legend, the river and village got its name from a wild garlic called Chicago, which grew abundantly in the swamps surrounding the village. We often start Chicago's story around 1830 because it's the moment that there's a transition from this being Indian country to American territory. And so it's a moment of real demographic change and American settlers from the east are coming in and they're taking up the farm fields that the Potawatomi and their allies had held for generations. In 1831, Chicago was on the edge of the American frontier. Jesse Walker, a Methodist circuit rider known as the Daniel Boone of Methodism, had organized a Methodist class at the Plainfield, Illinois settlement southwest of Chicago. In 1831, Walker and his associate, Stephen Beggs, journeyed to Chicago and preached at Fort Dearborn. Eventually, the team set up regular worship services in a log cabin on a place known as Wolf Point along the Chicago River. Jesse Walker and other circuit riders are going from place to place, and they're going where the settlements are, and they rely very much on um, settlers in an area that want to support them, and that um, on those Sundays that they're not with them will lead their own services and uh, rely on the circuit rider, but at the same time, they're creating their own community that's going to run alongside. And I think that's an important strain in thinking about Methodism and um, religion more generally in Chicago, is that there is that community first and then a call for, um, for a minister in a lot of ways. So there's, it's a, it's, it's, uh, that centrality of community is really important when we think about this region. They set up shop in a little blacksmith's cabin on what is now Wolf Point, where the three branches of the river come together. You know, now the Sun-Times building is there and a new apartment or condo building and um, it's close to the Merchandise Mart all there. After a short time, maybe a dozen people, 15 people, you know, had heard Reverend Walker and they said, we like what you're saying, let's start a Methodist church. Symbolically, it's interesting what these frontier Methodists did. The genius was to set up an institution in which uh, Methodist pastors were on circuits going out into the West remaining in an annual conference where they would gather together and debate issues of faith and doctrine, and then go out again into ministry. By the time the city was founded in 1837, you know, I don't know if they kicked the blacksmith out or whatever, but uh, they had taken over that log cabin and, you know, famously moved it to this spot when the city was founded in 1837. 
1837, a new pastor, Reverend Peter R. Boren, witnessed what one early Chicago historian described as a revival. The awakening was deep and widespread until 300 were received into the church upon the profession of their faith. The number of those brought within the Methodist fold equaled 10% of the entire population of the infant city. Among the new members was a future mayor of the city, Augustus Garrett, and his wife, Eliza. She's from New York, so she's got that story that her, she and her husband will wander a bit in the West before they settle on Chicago, and her husband will be a successful multi-term mayor of Chicago in the 1840s. They're also very much supporters of the, the Methodist Church. And again, in this ethos, this world where you're starting to create new congregations, so you're finding churches being created, and they're in the, on that founding generation. And then once the the churches are founded, it's looking out and saying, what else can we do to make this place a better place, to make improve this place for the next generation? And so schools are going to be a really big part of that. And Eliza Garrett in particular is committed to the idea that Methodist ministers should be well-trained. And when her husband dies, in 1855, Eliza Garrett gives this money to found what becomes Garrett Evangelical Seminary. In the early beginnings, members of this church helped to form Northwestern University. In fact, uh, there was a time that was written in the uh, uh, bylaws of, uh, of Northwestern that more than half of the uh, trustees had to be uh, members of the church. The early chairpersons of the board of, uh, of trustees of Northwestern University were from here. By this point, the Methodists in Chicago have also founded a ladies' college. Eliza Garrett is interested not only in training ministers, but she would really, really like to have seen uh, women being uh, educated. And in fact, that makes sense coming out of the Second Great Awakening that women need to be well educated. So Eliza Garrett is probably one of the most famous of the early congregants at First uh, Methodist. Members of the Methodist Church in downtown Chicago were as busy in the mid 19th century as the city itself, helping to launch nearly 200 new churches and playing decisive roles in the establishment of Methodist-based institutions like Wesley Memorial Hospital, later to become Northwestern Hospital, as well as homes for both the aged and orphaned children. One prominent member of the Methodist Church, Lucy Ryder Meyer, helped to found the Chicago Training School for City, Home, and Foreign Missions. She was instrumental in the establishment of Wesley Hospital, which was part of Northwestern Hospital, in getting the early members here to be board, uh, board members uh, of that hospital enterprise. She was also actively involved in a number of um, uh, social service ministries uh, throughout the area. Uh, some of them still exist uh, in, the, um, uh, in terms of retirement homes for persons, homes for orphans. Uh, she was actively involved in uh, creating a core of women who went out and, and uh, uh, started these kinds of institutions in, in the city of Chicago and beyond. Uh, Methodism has always been, and it still is, um, even here at the Chicago Temple, you see this endlessly. It is interested in the profound love and care of neighbor, including the outcast. The Methodists have always been at the forefront of questions of social justice. And so we see um, a group of, of men and women, but certainly women, people like um, Frances Willard, who's going to come to Chicago. She's going to be working for um, that ladies' college that's going to be merged into Northwestern University, but she's going to do it very much from the standpoint of her religiosity as a Methodist. And she's going to, after her time in academia, is going to turn to the Women's Christian Temperance Union and create this national organization related to temperance and draw women into the public sphere in a really important way across the 19th century. And she's going to bring lots of other women, draw other women, Methodist women in particular, into Chicago to work with her. 
As the city of Chicago grew, so did the Methodist Church. In fact, the United Methodist Church Chicago Temple has actually been housed in five different buildings at Clark and Washington Streets. The initial log cabin moved across the river sometime in the 1830s. A large, modern building with a traditional steeple in 1845, its third building in 1858 following the Great Chicago Fire, and an innovative commercial building slash worship space in 1873, and finally the towering skyscraper built in 1922, which endures today. You're building hospitals. That means you understand that there's a lot of sickness in the world, spiritual as well as physical. You're building schools. It means you realize there's a lot of ignorance in the world, and this ignorance is extremely dangerous. And of course, you're building churches. In 1893, Chicago hosted the World's Columbian Exposition to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World in 1492. The fair placed Chicago on the world stage and demonstrated that it had risen successfully from the ashes of the Great Chicago Fire, a fire that had not only destroyed the Methodist Church's third building, but also much of the city in 1871. The 1893 World's Fair, several of the members were highly active and trustees of that exposition, uh, kind of highlighting um, uh, their role, and it kind of spurred them on to make them want to, the church to be different and vibrant. Arthur Dixon, who was uh, very active as a business person and as alderman, who became president of the city council at one point. He became city council president mainly because after the great Chicago fire, there was a lot of um, corruption. And he modeled what it meant to be a person of faith and integrity. As the city of Chicago rebuilt itself after the fire of 1871, many downtown churches elected to move outside the new commercial center and into residential neighborhoods. The Methodist Church chose to stay put. You know, the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, that destroyed our third church building. And by then, you know, the congregation, they'd been here in the heart of the city since the founding of the city. They didn't want to relocate, although at one point all up and down Washington, there were as many as 10 churches going a mile west and all of them relocated, found other spots, went to the suburbs, but ours is the one that has stayed put right here on this corner. So the fourth church that they built after that, um, that's actually when they first had the idea of having a multi-use building. The top floors were the church space and the bottom floors were offices and shops. And in the, a picture that I've seen of that, I think you can kind of see there's a cigar store even on the corner. They knew tenants would want to work in this great location and have some income that would go to pay for the upkeep of the building. That way the money that the church members gave could go right to the mission and ministry and programs. So they formed this aid society about 100 years ago in the 19 teens. They had really outgrown that fourth church and wanted to dream big and so a new pastor, Reverend John Thompson, he was born in the UK but came to Chicago and was appointed our new pastor in 1920. And so he found the congregation at this turning point to bring together some of the church leaders and some of the business leaders together to dream big because they liked this concept of a multi-use building. By around 1922, they had hired the architects, Hollibert and Roche, to conceive of this grand temple. In September of 1924, they dedicated this great new church building. And apparently one of the first sermons that Reverend Thompson gave, he said, people will come to Chicago in search of gold, but at its center they will find a temple to God open to all. And so that name really resonated with the people. And um, so we're really first United Methodist Church, but people started calling our building the Chicago Temple Building. Today, the First United Methodist Church Chicago Temple is a thriving, active, urban congregation that still sees its mission as service in the heart of the city. One very public way of accomplishing this mission is to offer public guided tours of the building. 
Sanctuary, a brief history of the congregation and the Methodist movement, and concluding with a visit to its famous Sky Chapel. Parlor in the chapel, but a few stairs, we're almost there, okay? Make sure and bring your, your cameras and your phones if you want to take some pictures up here, okay? So welcome to the chapel in the sky, everyone. You are now in what is known to be the highest place above ground level for worship in the world. This is not the tallest church. I believe that distinction goes to Ulm Cathedral, which is in southern Germany. And of course, you could go to Colorado and be at higher elevation in a church on a mountain somewhere and be closer to God that way. But above ground level in a, a, a church, this is the highest place up above the ground that's a space dedicated to worship. And I told you that I would share the story of another famous woman in the life of our church and another interesting Chicago connection. I mentioned Harris Bank before. Well, I'm sure you've shopped at Walgreens before, right? You know that pharmacy store. Well, Walgreens was founded here in Chicago by a man named Charlie Walgreen. When he died, his widow, Myrtle, started going to church here. She got to know Reverend Goff who was that first pastor living in the apartment below, and together they dreamed up this idea, you know. Uh, I think Mrs. Walgreen probably said, you know, Charlie, you've got this empty space up there. We ought to build a chapel. I bet people would come to see it. So very generously in memory of her husband, Mrs. Walgreen gave the money so they could have the little parlor and this chapel built. And so the first service ever held up here was on Easter morning in 1952. And so that's one of the ways that we use the chapel. Every Easter we have early sunrise services at 6 and 7 in the morning. Those stained glass windows, they were designed by an Italian company. You see in every window there's this main image with the blue background. They go in order and tell the story of our faith. You can get married up here. We have a handful of weddings up here every year. Um, occasional prayer services, memorial services, or baptisms, just kind of for special occasions. Only 40 people are allowed at a time. And you can see only about 20 people can sit. So it's pretty full room with 40 people. But it, it sure is beautiful on Easter morning. The Chicago Temple is a magnificent house of God right here on one of the best corners in the world, you know, at Clark and Washington. It's a gritty, diverse, uh, pioneering institution for sure, very open-minded people with lots of love to serve, you know, and just because we've been here since the founding of the city, um, there's of course a lot of history, you know, of all the things that have changed on this corner, we've been the constant right here, you know, in this our, our fifth church building since the dawn of the city. And so one of our kind of cornerstone hymns, where cross the crowded ways of life, you know, and so that's, that's what this corner is all about. We're able to capture the diversity of our church in music and the many ways and many languages that we worship God. You know, we're blessed as a music ministry to have many different voices. We have a handbell choir, we have strings, we have woodwind and brass instruments, we have a, an amazing E.M. Skinner organ that is a whole orchestra in and itself and it's, you know, part of the breath of the, the building in its own way and part of the breath of the the congregation in the sanctuary. We have a harpsichord. We have a killer gospel choir. Our church congregation, um, we have people from the Philippines and South Korea and Nigeria and Guatemala. And so we musically can make a voice for all those places in the world, you know, and creatively sing, sing praises to God in all those different languages and styles because we just, we have a, a fearless choir and you know, a, a lot of talented people who like to do different types of music. Uh, we have all kinds of connections from musical to the Chicago Humanities Festival in which we seek to expose the larger society to cultural offerings that uh, they may not get in any other place. Being conveniently located in the downtown uh, near public transportation, uh, it is an ideal location for persons to gather. Silk Road Rising presents plays in the lower level of our church building here at First United Methodist Church. 
they were founded by a Pakistani Muslim man named Malik and his partner Jamil. This little 99-seat theater that we can use as a church, you know, for banquets or big meetings. There are three classrooms and a kitchen down in the lower level. But during theater mode, um, it can transform into this little state-of-the-art theater for Silk Road to present their plays. One of the uh, ministries in the church that uh, is truly effective, we provide a meal every Saturday for the homeless. Not only do we provide a meal, uh, but we uh, make clothing available, underwear, socks. This time of season, we're collecting uh, coats and mittens and and things for them. What I've noticed about our congregation, given this you know diverse location that we have, and our, our people, uh, the members who make up our church, and even other visitors, come from probably 85 or 90 percent of the zip codes in the whole city. So we have people coming from all over the city for various reasons, but I think they're attracted to this place because the type of people that are here, we're not boastful. You know, we just we like to do do stuff. We like to get the work done, and I think that's an identity of Methodism. You know, we're not afraid to just go out and be with the people. You know, that's what John Wesley was all about. He wasn't given a church to serve in Bristol and in, in the Episcopal tradition, and so he said, "Well, the world is my parish." So he logged over 200,000 miles on horseback and went to the pit mines and preached to the working class and the people he was fighting for. You know, there's a real practical side to Methodism. And I think here in the city, you know, the type of committees that we have, the types of ministries we have, the homeless program, we have a wonderful focus on the bereavement and grief support and people with depression and bipolar issues. Our people here, nothing's beneath us. We like to just go out and we don't ask for any praise. We just want to go out and, and do good work. And I, I would say that's kind of a, a good definition, definition of who we are. We, um, we just like to work hard and we don't expect a lot of credit back. You know, I just think we, we gain a lot of satisfaction just from, from being gritty and doing that work and helping the people that we, we're called to help. Uh. Welcome. Were you going to park your Cadillac right here as right usual? Here. It's open or tidying out the sanctuary to make sure you find your Bibles here. I love my church because this is the house of the Lord. I love my Father God and Jesus Christ that loves us all. The diversity is one of the things that I love about Chicago Temple. I don't necessarily need to be at the door, but I can also help down the aisle to uh, make comfortable and, and assist those people that might be Canadians, Germany. We have the whole world that comes to us. Another piece of this that I think is really important when I think about the Chicago Temple and its importance in the world today is that it's a place that isn't claimed by one neighborhood or one group. Its placement downtown has actually meant that, to some degree, it's a place that people choose to come to. Um, now there are lots more people living downtown who are going to claim this as a neighborhood congregation, and I think that's a really interesting development. But it's also a place where people can come to on Sunday or for other events and claim the space as their own, because downtown, it's space that's shared. Another piece of this that I think is really important when I think about the Chicago Temple and its importance in the world today is that it all also offers a refuge for groups of people that need to meet, that, need, that, that have to have a central place to meet, to, to exchange ideas, whether it's environmental, social justice, unions, um, all kinds of groups that don't have office space downtown can take advantage of the meeting spaces in the Chicago Temple. And so whenever you walk in that building, you um, are often going to uh, encounter people who are there for Methodist events and services, but there are also going to be people there who are taking advantage of the fact that the Methodists are offering this space as a place where different groups across the city can meet and discuss a better future. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. My uh, prayer for the city is that we would 
see ourselves as one large family and not one another as enemies, that we would join hands together to fix our problems rather than point fingers of blame, that we would do our part to uh, help the city uh, become uh, even more vibrant than what it is, that instead of being known as a place of uh, racial division, that we might be a place where uh, everyone finds a home.